Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host this evening, Brian Broom, and I'm joined by uh, Greg Unninger and Emily Maxson. Tonight we'll be talking about that wicked woman, Jezebel, and... Or is she a a boss babe? We don't know. <laughs> We're going to talk about it. It seems that in recent years, Jezebel has been alternatively a, a name to throw at people who don't agree with you, <laughs> and alternatively a name to claim for yourself if you are of a particular uh, ideological persuasion. So we're going to look at her and... Is there anything good in her? I don't know, but we're going to talk about the bad for sure. And um, I heard her eyeshadow game was on point. Yeah. <laughs> well, there yes. we go. There, that that's one good thing. I think. Yeah, I think that's a point in her favor. But okay, but so you, you, there's you know, that. Over the year, fundamentalism have looked at that particular thing and have thereby condemned eyeshadow and other makeup because, well, mm. I your generation may not know the expression, but mine certainly did. That painted Jezebel. <laughs> uh, yes, I do know this phrase. Yeah, I can was... infer the meaning from the... Oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, real easy to put that one together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have to talk about the whole painting <laughs> thing before we're done, but that's ought to be a minor point, although it hasn't always been. Mm. So, Jezebel, she was a Phoenician princess. Uh, her father was... Uh, a priest of Astarte or Asheroth or Sher one, one of the A names for the female goddess of the Canaanites. And um, not content with that role, he assassinated his king and took the throne. And so Jezebel had a great pattern here in how to run a kingdom. Assassination <laughs> was right up front. Trusting nobody was probably real close behind that. <laughs> She got farmed off to Ahab of Israel in a political marriage, but she seems to have been loyal to her new husband in the sense that, we talked about this earlier, she never apparently stabbed him in the back or betrayed him or sold him out and forwarded his own desires when he was too weak to do anything and moved to give him what he wanted, even if it was the illegal, immoral, and atrocious so, you know, and that's when she was very supportive. Well, you know, um, thinking through history, have there, I can't think of very many times where the queen assassinates the king to whom she is married and then retains any semblance of power. So, like, this, this loyalty is pretty <laughs> self interested here. That's yeah, true. I think some queen mothers have tried it and almost got away with it, but um, not, you know, the queen's not so much. So there, there, there's probably some, some self-interest going on. And, and, and yet there are some things that she did for her husband that she didn't directly get much out of. She just made her husband feel good. I'm thinking here particularly of the whole Naboth's Vineyard thing, mm -hmm. where she got the blood on her hands and didn't even really tell her husband what she was doing. And then God came <laughs> down hard upon Ahab, rather than and incidentally on her, because Ahab was the king and he should have known it, should have stopped it. Oh, a side note, just while we're here, uh, her her uh, father, uh, Ethelbale, is known to secular history through the writings of Josephus, quoting an earlier uh, Greek or Phoenician historian. She turns out is the great aunt of Dido of Carthage. Hey, no way. Yeah. So. Oh, wow. And I and in finding that out, I finally found out how to pronounce Dido. I for <laughs> twenty years I didn't know it was Dido. Dido. Or Dido. Yeah, neither I don't. Anyway, so for those of you who've ever read the Aeneid or, or know the, the myth of the founding of Rome, there's a connection there. Um, because Carthage, of course, was a Phoenician, that is to say Canaanite, that is to say Tyre and Sidon type colony mm. uh, that worship Baal and Moloch. But that's another time. It's another story for another time, perhaps. So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a political alliance. Now, something else. Political alliances, as we know, were always religious alliances. Mm -hmm. You swore in the name of your common God, which meant somebody had to give ground here. You either admitted that your God was subservient to the God mm -hmm. of the other person in this deal, or you somehow tried to identify them 
like Zeus and Amon Ra were the same god. Or there was a third Territorialize? Possibility. Yeah, something like that. We're like, uh, I'm leaving the mountains to come to the valley, <laughs> yeah, and I will now worship the god of the I valley. Will, I will worship the relevant god over here. Which is to say we're dealing with polytheism at its best or worst, uh, which in the ancient world meant pluralism. And Jezebel gets a lot of her support from would-be pluralists who see in her an open-minded attitude to accept various sorts of gods except one. The god of Israelite fundamentalism was right out, <laughs> but the assumption has been, since all we know about Jezebel is in the Bible, and the Bible's hostile to her and favorable to this, uh, this fundamentalist prophet Elijah, obviously the Bible isn't telling us the whole story. And Jezebel just must have stepped on too many toes because she was a strong-willed woman and an age didn't appreciate such things. And her pluralism got in the way of fundamentalism. So this nice lady who got stuck in a kingdom that wasn't hers, trying to be faithful to her husband and trying to make everything work for everybody, got the shaft and eventually was thrown to the dogs. That's kind of the modern take on Jezebel as far as I can see. Uh, feminism. Well, we all know that strong-willed women are very prone to murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it wasn't so much murder. Maybe she was, maybe that's just exaggeration. I, I don't, because the thing is, as, as everybody will admit, aside from that one reference that I, that I brought up, that she somehow related to Dido, um, there's no other historical record on Jezebel, except that in Kings and the Bible. So you can speculate all you want as to what the writer, and therefore God, is hiding from us or hasn't revealed to us, but to concoct your own vision of who and what Jezebel must have been based on the prejudices of God <laughs> is, is a dangerous kind of proposition any way you look at it. And nobody would try to do anything seriously historical. E even if you approach a controversial character who's presented by some author's whose prejudice you don't, you don't share, you're not simply going to reinvent the, the antagonist here out of whole cloth because you want to find someone like you there. Mm -hmm. That's the worst sort of trying to not be a historian that historians <laughs> can ever be. Uh, it, it would be one thing to say, well, we don't know how much we can trust this because we don't believe God actually wrote the Bible. We don't trust the, the original scribe or whoever the final editor was. I mean, you, you can say all that. That's nice unbelief, but to go the extra step of stupidity and say, and therefore I imagine that Jezebel must have been like, is right out um, idiotic. And yet people have done it. So perhaps we should look a little bit about what exactly she did. And so I'm, I'm going to just read a few references here and there. Feel free to supply um, your, your favorite part of the story if I, if I skip over it. We're introduced to her in. Chapter 16 of 1 Kings, we are told that Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And he came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. That's the golden calf worship. Then he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal which he'd built in Samaria, and he made a grove, or the original is a, a share pole. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Well, now, <laughs> it's, the, the writer quite does, an accolade. <laughs> yeah, the writer does not waste any. So tell us what you really think. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, but, but notice that the blame falls primarily upon Ahab. Uh, yes, she's not a nice lady, but the main condemnation is upon Ahab because he's the king of God's people and he did and should have known better. And yet he marries a pagan. And we've seen in scripture a number of times what complications that leads to. Can think back as brief, uh, as short a time ago as um, Solomon marrying 700 foreign princesses. Ahab yeah. only married one. And, and, and things were really bad. Baal worship. Uh, I think we've talked about Baal worship before, but this is a good point just, just to remind everybody of what it is. This is, a, this is nature worship. It's the worship of the primal forces of the cosmos, if that's even a word that pagans can use, of the multiverse. Um, 
the bail is the male dimension manifested in lightning and fire and thunder and rain, the things that descend from heaven and permeate Mother Earth uh, to bring forth life, but also that suggest danger and destruction. Uh, Astarte, Ashera, Ashtaroth, there's a number of, of names for the female side. She's Mother Earth. She's the fertility of the land, of the woman's body and the cattle and the sheep and such. Uh, the feminine side of nature. And when the male and the female get together you know, harmoniously, then things are great and society flourishes. There are crops, there are children being born, there's peace, there's plenty. The problem is that nature, by nature, is um, chaotic. And, and the gods, such as they are, don't necessarily get along. And it is the job of the king and his priests to try to bring some kind of order. And the way that you tame nature is through that which is anti-natural. You shock nature into conformity. And thus the most vicious, um, horrible kinds of activities were cataloged as uh, acts of religious virtue, child sacrifice, self-castration, cutting yourself until the blood flows. Um, these sorts of things were a way to get nature on your side, to make nature sit up and pay attention. Now, Bell and Asheroth were not necessarily conceived of as personal beings. They could be described in those terms if it were useful. But fundamentally, they were the forces of nature that man had to tame by his magic. And since the king and the queen, king particularly, were the great magicians, the social engineers that made society work, the good king was the one who made nature behave and brought you good harvests and, and mm. lots of new children and all of that. The bad king was the one who let it all get out of control. Yeah. To assassinate a king then was to war against the gods. Unless you succeeded, then that must be the gods' will and the next step in the, in the process. So this is the religion that uh, Ahab adopted and that Jezebel forwarded as being the daughter of a priest of Astarte. The one thing that that's, this kind of polytheism or pluralism can't tolerate is any idea of absolutes. That there should be a single God who is sovereign and Lord of all was absolutely outside their range of thinking because that's the sort of God you like, would like have to obey, mm. who can boss you around and tell you what to do and, and condemn you for your sins and call judgment upon you. No, the gods are things to be manipulated and controlled and used. Powerful, dangerous like electricity or, or nuclear power, sure. But if we're careful, we can make this thing work. But absolute gods with absolute authority and absolute morality, no, that that, that wasn't a thing. Well, it's, it's um, interesting, too, that you bring up, uh, you know, doing anti-natural things to tame nature. Uh, that immediately reminded me, I think I brought it up the last time I, that I was on the podcast, a another podcast that I listened to that talked about the Aztecs and mm, one of the yeah. gods that the Aztecs worshipped was uh, known as the flayed god, Ugh. and the priests would, as I don't remember how often they did this, but as part of one of the worship services for it, they would wear the inside-out flayed skins of human victims oh, and for weeks. Oh, and um, you know. How gross is that? How anti-natural is that? But it's it's all on the same kind of continuum of tribalistic uh, pagan god worship. You know, I'm I'm remembering just in passing. We've talked about peace child a number of times, mm -hmm. but there's a there's a later section beyond the offering of the peace child where Don Richardson confronted some of the death rituals mm -hmm. of the tribe he was ministering to, a Papa and Kitty. <laughs> And and that same kind of thing came up. I don't. I it's been too long since I read it to remember the details. But I just remember that the the people there themselves were disgusted at what their death rituals required. And when they came to Christ and understood this is stupid, pointless, and and actually wicked, they were so relieved. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't have to do that anymore. Cool. <laughs> this is great. Don't anybody do that when I die. Just. Put me in the ground and I'll go and be with Jesus. This is wonderful. Paganism was, you know, ever since the 60s, there's been this myth that paganism is kinder, gentler, sweeter, 
mm-hmm. um, tamer, closer to nature. Uh, and it's not true. No, pagans don't like being pagans if they have any sensibilities. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, I mean, in, in that they're used to it and they're terrified mm-hmm. not to do anything else. Yeah, sure. But no, it's, it's, it's a horrific way to live. And the ancient mm-hmm. world was terrified of demons and of magic. And so this was what Ahab was inflicting upon Israel. You know, sometimes the reward for sin is more sin. Mm-hmm. You want to you sin? God says, fine, here, I'll show you some. You, you, you want to worship foreign gods? Let me show you foreign culture. Be, be under their thumb for a while and see what happens. But it was in this, although God, with one hand, opened this door and let Baal worship enter Israel. With the other, he, rose, he raised up one of the most uh, colorful figures <laughs> in all scripture, Elijah the Tishbite. I think the next couple podcasts, or maybe the next few, center on Elijah, so I won't spoil all that right now. <laughs> but uh, while surrendering Israel to Baal worship, you, you, you want golden calves? Well, let me show you real paganism. Here, have a pagan queen and a king under her thumb, and you can go the way of, of nature worship and anti-nature. And, um, you know, God's people suffered. God's prophets suffered. Jezebel didn't want competition. She killed the prophets. Uh, and so that Elijah, rightly or wrongly, uh, says, I'm the only one left. Now, it turns out that there was more to the story than that. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's he, he confronts Ahab at Mount Carmel thinks everything's great, and then Jezebel again sends one threatening letter. You're so dead. And he runs for his life. Uh, and God has to meet him at Horeb and, and re-encourage him. Uh, and at that point, Jezebel kind of drops into the background for a while. And I think the next uh, major counter, which we mentioned a minute ago, was that of Naboth. Naboth was a godly man who had uh, a vineyard near to uh, Ahab's summer palace in Jezreel. And, and Ahab said, hey, Naboth, I'd like to buy your vineyard. Now, that in itself was not a problem. You could, in Israel, you could sell your property until the Jubilee, which was, you know, if the person you're selling it to is already in his 50s or 60s and Jubilee's, Jubilee's 30 years away, and, you know, that's, that's an effective sale. Just revert to your whoever's heirs when it's all over. Perhaps he perhaps he wasn't thinking that. Perhaps he wanted it absolutely. But whatever the case, Naboth simply says, no. It's the inheritance of my fathers, something that God has given our family line to treasure and to keep. So, no, I, I can't do that. And Ahab goes home and pouts a lot. And Jezebel comes and finds out, well, what's going on? Well, Naboth won't tell me. Th- All right. Well, that mama Jezebel take care of it. You just sit here and, and don't don't worry about it. And I'll, I'll cover it. And she arranges for... Um, Naboth to be judicially murdered, to cut through the story, and then comes and tells her husband, Naboth's dead, it's all yours, go take it. And Ahab, without asking any questions, jumps in his chariot and goes to claim the land. And Elijah again confronts him and blames not Jezebel, but Ahab. So that, that's the kind of woman we're dealing with here. She is uh, pragmatic. She knows which side her bread is buttered on. She wants to help her husband get what he wants. A happy king is going to be a happy queen. Happy children who will step in and, and fill Ahab's role when he's gone. Because in those days, kings did still fight in battle. And Ahab, despite all of his uh, weaknesses, was not physically uh, cowardly. He, he does go into battle eventually and dies there. Jezebel outlives him, becomes queen mother for a while, and is the spider in the background pulling the webs on, on her, uh, her children. I believe the next time we run into Jezebel, and I may be forgetting something here, say if, if you think otherwise, <laughs> um, is at the end when um, God finally says, well, enough is enough with Ahab's household. We're going to get rid of this whole Baal thing. It's been going on long enough. It's gone through a couple generations of kings. And he has Elisha uh, send a young man to anoint a frontier captain, Jehu, to go exterminate the whole house of Ahab. And he does. He does a great job. And um, having killed both the king of Israel and the king of Judah, he rides into Jezreel. And there's Jezebel. 
And this is this is the story that most people remember about her. This is chapter 9 of 2 Kings. When Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face, tired her head, and looked out on the window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. And when he was come, he did eat and drink and said, eh, Go see now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more than the skull and the feet to the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall the dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. Well, we'll see more of her influence in later podcasts as we talk about her daughter, Athaliah, but that's the end of her immediate story. And what most people remember, fundamentalism for a long time has made a big deal out of her getting all gussied up and she put on makeup. And the How dare she? Yeah, the assumption kind I of I bet is, she danced right before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe she even read a book. <laughs> had her own ideas started thinking started thinking yeah um the commentators have seemed to or, or pastors at least have seemed to often have misread this uh isaac asimov interestingly enough got it right in his uh science fiction novel caves of steel his uh, protagonist elijah bailey is married to a woman named jezebel and oh. Jezebel, his Jezebel, is rather proud of her name because it's kind of racy and, and spicy. <laughs> and and basically, Elijah, her husband, in a moment of, you know, they're Elijah, Jezebel, ha ha, I just caught that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's basically, be, in a moment of honoriness, says, no, Jezebel wasn't at all what you think. She was actually just a... Uh, this is this is the quote. In a moment of irritation, I insisted that the historic Jezebel was not particularly wicked and was, if anything, a good wife. And that little thing of putting down his wife's pretensions to be a little spicy and racy because of the name actually becomes a major plot point. And, <laughs> and that almost gives things away right there. Um, but he, too, understands that what she was and he explains that she wasn't she wasn't trying to be seductive. She was dressing up as a queen. She was she was going to carry this to the end. She was going to be proud and defiant and royal. She's looking down at in her mind as an assassin and a usurper. You don't yield to such people. You don't bow the knee to them. You don't cringe. And so she dresses up to present herself in all of her uh, nobility, in the political sense, all of her aristocratic power and glory. And, and perhaps is hoping to overawe him, but at the very least, she's not going to go down cringing. She, her one line is, "Had Zimri peace who slew his master?" Yeah, you're, you're not going to get away. Yeah, you're not going to get away with Zimri was an earlier regicide who managed to live for all of a week before other people took him out. Ahab's father, actually. Uh, but uh, Jehu won't. Well, deal with her and just ask the eunuchs to throw her down. And and so, you know, we most children remember the dogs eating Jezebel because children like bloody gory stories as witness fairy tales, uh, which yeah. is one reason God puts these things in here. And then we try to hide, <laughs> then we hide them from children. I mean, that's how kind and of we wonder why the children don't like to read the Bible. <laughs> yeah. And hide all the good stories. Anyway, um, so there's that. The, the, the interesting thing, the word... Let's see if I can find my my note here. The thing about the um, the eyeshadow actually is that it's something that uh, God uses. Uh, Isaiah fifty four eleven, uh, he God speaks of adorning His own bride, and the word He uses in, in a mixed metaphor is He switches from describing her as a temple being built or a city or a house to being a bride, he goes for painting, but it, the word he uses is the same word for eyeshadow. 
Hmm. So God puts eyeshadow on his bride. That's the problem is not the eyeshadow <laughs> thing. The problem is the character of the woman who's doing it and why she's doing it. Uh, I don't think any of us have a problem with a strong woman standing up to a usurper and saying, you're not getting away with this. If such a thing could happen in the abstract, but it never happens in the abstract. There's always a context. There's always a historical situation that involves commitment to one ethic or another, one worldview or another, one God or another. And she'd chosen the wrong God. She'd chosen the state and power and nature. And she took her stand in terms of that. And while we can appreciate her boldness and her courage. She's a uh, go-getter. Yeah, she is. <laughs> yeah. But on the wrong side. <laughs> right. <laughs> She's I mean, strong. We, that doesn't make her good. No. I mean, we can appreciate Hitler's gift for oratory, too. Yeah. Uh, he made the trains run on time, I hear. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Julius Caesar's uh, military uh, prowess, but you know, Alexander's. And it, it is not, we, as Christians, we don't compromise by seeing the good gifts that God has left, even, even in the, the character and personality of believers. And yet we must judge them by the same standard we judge ourselves. There's no, there's no pluralism allowed here. We cannot say, well, from a neutral point of view, there are no neutral points of view. <laughs> right. There's God's and there's everything that's not God's. And God passed judgment on this woman, and it wasn't good. There is one more uh, reference to Jezebel, but not to her historically, but her name is used in the book of Revelation uh, when Jesus wants to condemn a, a self-appointed prophetess in one of the churches. In the world. This is the church of Thyatira. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. The church is really big on works. <laughs> and the last to be more than the first, he doesn't condemn them, but there's just sort of this, you know, there's more of the faith than just working, but still, okay, good works. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. In other words, she wasn't really, but she put on airs as if she were one, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed into idols. And they gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then they commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. That's pretty blunt. Mm -hmm. And all the churches shall know that I am he with church at the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not known this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you another burden with that which you have already. Hold fast till you come. It seems that this woman, and it's unlikely her name was actually Jezebel, it seems to be just Jesus' um, label for her. Uh, she claims some kind of prophetic gift. She... Uh, was accepted by the church as a teacher of doctrine, as a spiritual leader. But what she was teaching amounted to, we're not told with what word she did or exactly what her rationale was, but she taught um, the Christians in the church to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. This is very similar to um, the critique of the previous church. in. Um, Chapter 2, verse 14, Behold, I have a few things against thee, because how thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, that taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. The references to Numbers, <coughs> when Balaam, having <coughs> proved incapable of cursing Israel, uh, off camera says to Balak, the king, um, I can't curse them, I can tell you God, how you can get God to curse them. Send in your female prostitutes. Send in the temple prostitutes and um, make, have them make nice, nice, and um, see what God does. And God brought plagues upon his people. That seems to be the reference here in both cases. Uh, the idea was you really need to understand the other side. You need to, you, there, there's either there's truth there or at least there's, there's knowledge there. You know what kids say, well, mom, dad, you never really did drugs, so you don't know what it's all about. <laughs> or you did drugs and therefore you can't criticize me. You know, the, the 
head shoe. Catch twenty two. Yeah, that. So apparently she was she was doing this. She was telling people that blur the line, blur the antithesis. You can go and you can visit these temples and you can commit ritual fornication and you will understand the other side so much better. And the uh, the Lord mentions their doctrine, which they apparently called the knowing the depths of Satan. Uh, if you if you really understand how the powers of darkness work and know the, the deepest of the dark, then you'll be a more effective Christian. No. <laughs> <laughs> like some Christians who give them stuff to studying evil conspiracies and magic and, and occult weirdness rather than concentrating on knowing Jesus better. When we, when we get down to, to externals, uh, it's very easy to turn to, to forsake the gospel for a list of things to do. And one of the things that often comes up is being afraid of the enemy. And because you're afraid of him, you got to know all about him. Yeah. And that's scary. And that well, blinds you to other pitfalls, right? Like oh, if, yeah. if you're so focused on fighting the occult instead of fighting for Jesus, you're going to not be fighting against all of the other things that are fighting against Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you're fighting and, on one front when it's a 17 million front battle. Yeah. And too often you're going to pick up the, the instruments, the weapons of the enemy. Well, this stuff, this stuff works so well for them. If we just kind of turn it on its head, they're using black magic. Let's use white magic, or let's we won't even think Fight of fire it. Fire with fire. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, we may not call it magic. We may not even think of it as magic. But once someone looks at it, like, where's that in the Bible? Well, you know, it's just something. It's this, it's this thing that we picked up here and there, and because of this and the testimonies. Well, we're, calling, and, we're calling on angels to help yeah, fight the angels. principalities and powers. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Or these special kind of prayer cloths, or these special formal prayers, or... We have the, these the, shofars that were blessed by Jewish <laughs> rabbis and a Baptist minister. Yeah. And we're going to blow them, and it's going to save America. Yeah. What scares me, Brian, is it sounds like you're speaking from personal experience. Oh, yeah. Not, <laughs> not personal experience, like, in my, in my upbringing. There was never anyone... To my memory, anyway, <laughs> who who brought in a, a shofar and, and blew it in service, but uh, those circles I have I have heard and seen uh, <laughs> social media posts about it. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, yeah, I have several friends who grew up experiencing those things. They they're real. It's not just a legend. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I didn't see that in my religious upbringing, but in my conservative conspiracy oriented upbringing. I saw a lot of obsession with um, the powers of darkness and what might lie, what might lie behind all the conspiracies, and it was frightening. Yeah, and the response was never the gospel. It was well, educate people, mm. like you're going to educate them out of their own sinfulness and covetousness. No, that's not. You don't even understand the issue yet. Well, so. it also reminds me of that um, that wonderful sermon that. Or I don't know if you would technically qualify, classify it as a sermon, but something R.C. Sproul taught, I think, at the Strange Fire conference oh, uh -huh. way back when. But he, his talk, whatever it was, wherever it was, was called Pentecostals and the Sovereignty of Satan, mm -hmm. and how in those circles, Satan is treated as more sovereign than God. He's the one who causes yeah. all the problems. He's the one who is in control of every little thing that's making your life go wrong. It's never really your sin or things, your, your own sinfulness that cause problems. It's, Oh, well, this is an attack of the devil. It's like, how powerful is Satan? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in those circles as well. And it's not limited to Pentecostals, obviously, but oh, in no. those circles, especially what it's, it's more obvious there is the focusing so much on, on what the enemy is quote unquote capable of. And then therefore figuring out, like you said, educating yourself on the ways to combat it. There's different methods. Here are the seven keys to victory. Here are the five spiritual practices that lead you to contentment and blah, 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 blah. It just goes on and on and on. It's just constant influx of law preaching. Yeah, exactly. Good point. And here's a list of the five things you must do to take on a demon. First, ask the demon its name. What? Why am I having a conversation with a demon in the first place? That's... But, you know, it, it degenerates down. It's not that somebody comes in and says, let me teach you magic. 
It's the fact magic is the natural default when we walk away from the sovereignty of God. Because mm-hmm. if God's not sovereign, then we're thrown out in a universe full of powers and we better grab what we can. Maybe God's got a few hints out there. And if the Bible doesn't tell us, well, maybe somebody else can. And we'll find a way to take on this darkness. And there have been a lot of Christian novels and movies made around this whole idea. Oh, dear. That there are ways of fighting the demonic that, well, they're not exactly in the Bible, but, you know, they're spiritual, whatever that means. But to get us back to Jezebel and perhaps look for an ending here, this Jezebel revelation at first glance isn't exactly like the other, except in this She's pluralist. She says that you can you can dabble in all of these religious experiences, and certainly ritual fornication is an experience. And and God's going to be okay with this. There there again is no absolute moral or ethical antithesis. There's no religious antithesis. Um, there's something true here to be found, and in maybe maybe something negative to be avoided, but you won't know until you try it. Mm. And the original Jezebel was sort of the same sort. I mean, she tolerated golden calf worship, which supposedly was Yahweh worship. And uh, when the confrontation with Elijah comes on Mount Carmel, not only are the um, prophets of Baal there, but there are other prophets, presumably those of the calf. So it was all right, this um, idolatrous, quote, Yahweh worship, unquote, could be mixed with Baalism, but Baalism took the, the ascendant role. But true Yahweh worship, where the prophet comes and wags a finger in your face and thus saith the Lord, famine's coming, um, drought's coming, no rain, you better repent. That's That was intolerable. Uh, a, a lot of stuff is okay. But when people stand up and they have a standard, and I'm thinking here of Francis Schaeffer's lines in uh, How Shall We Good Live, when a society, when a group of people has a standard by which to judge the state, the state cannot tolerate them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's unacceptable. Polytheists and pluralists and open-minded people are great until you stand up in the name of the sovereign God and say, yeah, that's wrong. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that we have, we're have we calling for anybody's death or torture or anything like that. We're just saying you're wrong, but that's unacceptable. You can't call people wrong. Mm. But we can be wrong, but no one else can, which is, you know, the the great absurdity and paradox of all this, because it's not about love and equality. It's about kicking God out of the universe. Whatever takes his place is fine. The critical thing is to get the true God out of the universe. After that, we'll figure it out. Well, and, and two, with the individuals, the prophets of this golden calf, it, it's just another example of the fact that when you try to find the compromise points on the essentials Mm -hmm. you end up completely losing the heart of true worship of god sort of like with um the recent debates around things like uh efs slash ess slash (laughs) eras slash insert whatever acronym (laughs) other people are using for it. it it's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily find itself in the same root of trying to compromise with blatantly pagan systems but it, it is still something that you you mess with an essential and in so doing you end up losing the heart of the very thing you're claiming to defend it's self-defeating yeah and, and we are all good creedalists and confessionalists as well as believers in inerrancy and verbal inspiration. So we believe that you can say the truth in simple words, and having said it, it is true. Mm -hmm. And it's true in an absolute sense. And it's true in the sense that anything that disagrees with it is wrong and absolutely wrong. And being creedalist, we know that even the most basic doctrines of the faith are not up for grabs. The doctrine of creation, the Trinity, of the inspiration of scripture, the hypostatic union of the two natures in one person in Christ, justification by faith. These are, these are not things that you can mess around with. The unity of God, we've, we've seen, we've had that discussion here before. Mm-hmm. What happens if you start saying, well, God's kind of complex and he has many parts and angles. No, no. 
and in, in that sense, Christianity is fairly easy to track. There are things that are beyond human comprehension, to be sure, and yet we can say them in ways that, okay, this and not that, this and not that, there you go. We don't like that. But it doesn't matter what you like. <laughs> this is what the Bible says. Says you, yes, and 2,000 <laughs> years of Christian testimony, too. So... Mm-hmm. Um, Take it or leave it. 2,000 years of Christian testimony by people who were smarter than either of us put together. <laughs> yes, and who often gave their lives defending these things. So anyway, that makes us a, a sort of a minority within a minority. But that's okay. May God continue to use these things as we talk about them, to be line upon line sometimes, mm-hmm. piece by piece. You know, this is why um, teaching children the faith is not something you do in a quick one-week sa- session, let alone an over-the-night mountaintop experience at some retreat. You know, this is something that you have to grow into. This is why catechism, whether it, using a traditional catechism or something that just emphasizes the doctrines and, and, and practices of your own communion, are, th- th- these are basic things. This is why parents sit down and should read the Bible with their kids. It takes a long time to build these things. But the wise man says, if you train up the child in the way it should go when he's old, when he has a beard, he won't depart out of it. We, we build for the future. We build to stay, but it takes time. And our generation does not like that. Our generation wants instantaneous accomplishment. Mm. Show, show us how we can win back America in one month and we'll, we'll, we'll raise millions of dollars. Mm. Instantaneous accomplishment that. under our own power. Under our own power, because God hasn't promised anything like that. But we try to usurp the role of the Spirit and put him under our thumb. It's always that amusing thing. of so, revival coming here in three weeks. Uh, <laughs> revival uh, was postponed uh, due to rain. Yeah. <laughs> Can't the Holy Spirit work in the rain? <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I, think, I think that's uh, probably a good place to to draw to a close. Um, I think the the kind of tying it up in a bow point would just be the the fact that one of the th- one of the primary things that made Queen Jezebel such a destructive influence, I guess that's the best way to describe it, is the fact that she undermined the worship, the true worship of Yahweh and introduced a pluralistic idea of what truth could be and it in it just absolutely wreaked havoc on Israel the solution to that was Elijah being yeah. the 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 preacher of the truth and ultimately obviously the 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 true solution was uh, the coming of Christ and his death on the cross but you know in the temporal limited generation that Jezebel was adjacent to it was Elijah yeah. And we will see more of Elijah in weeks to come. That'll be good. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining me for this. And thank you to our listeners for joining us as well. Uh, if, you would, if you're new to us and you would like to follow us, you can do so on our YouTube channel, on Rumble. You can follow our Facebook page. You can subscribe to the podcast through any number of podcast catchers. I believe we're on all of them. If you would like to reach out to us with questions or comments or any kind of feedback, I mean, any, anything you really want to reach out to us about, <laughs> uh, you can do so at our email, which is haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. Uh, you can also support us financially, if you so wish, at anchor.fm forward slash halting toward Zion. We also want to thank all of our financial supporters for doing so. You helped make this show possible. Thank you very much. And finally, a hearty thank you to David Maxson, who is our producer and helps get the episodes out to you. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you again for listening.